so we're kicking off a new series here at Interop Working Group, and a, a bit of it is um, inspired by, from um, our time at IIW. So Claire, myself, and Lamari were all there, and there was a lot of discussion around, um, you know, use cases and user adoption and Interop, even though that was you know, even there, there was some discussion, but majority of the conversation was very technical in nature, but there was, you know, a small group of people who were really interested in learning more about this. So this is this is what gave birth to this series. Um, and we're really happy to welcome Dan as our <laughs> guinea pig to kick this off. So thank you so much. So a little bit about Dan, he's the founder at Credivira. So prior to Credivira, Dan leveraged his industry and regulatory knowledge, financial acumen and technology expertise to co-found um, Caledonia so, uh, Solutions. It is a supply chain software company um, um, for the dangerous goods industry, moving the industry away from paper into digital innovation. And his focus remains on digitizing traditional business processing uh, processes while building inclusive and inspired teams to create everyday impact. Um, also being community focused, Dan supports numerous local charities and the growth of technology in Canada through the A100, um, TEC Canada Blockchain Advisory, and as a board member of the Athabasca University um, within the Business Leadership Advisory Council. Welcome, Dan, and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Bonnie. I appreciate it. And uh, for those of you that don't know Bonnie, uh, you guys should. Uh, she's really awesome, and uh, and she's a pillar to the ID Lab component or where Canada's moving in the identity space. So um, highly recommend you guys reach out to Bonnie and connect with her as well. Uh, we as Creative Era do appreciate working with ID Lab. It's been an incredible experience and um, lots of subject matter expertise there with a beautiful global view um, of what's happening. So um, thanks everybody for joining today. Again, my name is Dan Jurescu. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Creative Era. Um, Creative Era was founded in 2018. And um, our purpose was to look at and explore basically uh, blockchain technologies, understand um, you know all the nuances between private public, um, and then ultimately make some business decisions of how do we get into uh, utilizing the technology for our own B two B SaaS um, tech that we are looking to bring to market. Um, over the years, we've obviously seen a, a growth in that. Um, in the blockchain space on both the public and private space. And um, over time, we ended up um, finding ourselves more and more uh, focused on verifiable credentials and the power the verifiable credentials bring to the market as um, our business strategy has always been to ultimately find a way in which we can uh, connect three different distinct parties together in a win-win-win situation. So. Um, typically, as we know, in project management or other places, you always kind of have to pick one of one of three or two of three, but you never really get three of three. So um, the value for us and where we ultimately started, and I, and I promise I'll show the deck in a second, um, but from where we started is, as Bonnie mentioned in my introduction, the last tech company that I founded that ultimately got acquired in 2016 focused in the movement and transportation of dangerous goods across Canada and the US. So we built a traceability solution that allowed um, multiple parties to work off of a single source of truth. Uh, those parties included private businesses, public businesses, and ultimately regulated bodies across Canada and the US. So growing that tech company, I ended up uh, spending a lot of time in, uh, in implementing the technology and field operations. Um, so think of oil and gas, energy, transportation being some of our biggest uh, partners that our solution was developed for. And um, in that ecosystem, I had to earn a lot of credentials and certifications to prove my ability to be on those job sites and to actually physically work there with those uh, representatives kind of shoulder to shoulder. So um, that's ultimately what spurred the growth and the opportunity to bring Credit Vera to market. And with seeing the, the changes in the GDPR ecosystem in Europe, then obviously the California state laws of data, data privacy that followed, and in Canada with the um, enablement of Bill C-27 and C-25, uh, which is for the data privacy of Canadians and uh, businesses, we found ourselves uh, finding a, an opportunity where verifiable credentials was really the solution for where we wanted to grow and what we wanted to do. 
So um, I'm going to share my uh, my screen and um, bring up our deck. And please let me know when you can see this. Or yes. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. Um, I guess I can do presenter mode. I have no idea. I don't do this very often. Okay, can you see a full screen of this? Yes. Okay. Um, awesome. Sorry, this is a it's a new slide view for me, so I um, I'm trying to figure out how to use it properly. How do I move this out of way out of my screen? Sorry, I can. Oh, there we go. Now I can see my screen. Um, Okay, so for the agenda for today, um, we're gonna uh, cover a few uh, topics. So what is the problem or opportunity? What was the solution? Uh, what were some of the technology choices and why? Uh, what's the user adoption and journey look like? Uh, interoperability, the approach we took, and then uh, some parting wisdom or words and what's next for our company. So the way that we, um, we broadcast our technology into the ecosystem. We refer it as being uh, the first, uh, the world's first open exchange for verifiable credentials. And uh, there is a component of first uh, because of the work that we do in the subset and space that we typically operate into. So when we look at our traditional uh, user base for our technology, it is very much in the, what we call high risk profile workforce which comprises of an individual having to own, manage, and control um, typically anywhere between 10 to 20 certifications, competencies, and training at any given point in time in good standing for them to be able to perform their job that day. So for us, um, ultimately, as I mentioned, leveraging Web3 technology, uh, Creativera ultimately allows each of us, us being the workforce, to own our personal professional credentials wherever we are, and securing the individual's privacy um, using industry compliance and trusted relationships. So the reason why this is important, and we brought in a quote from Corn Ferry, and those that are not familiar with Corn Ferry, it is uh, the largest uh, executive uh, employment and, uh, and uh, placement organization in the world. Um, and their statement really talks about uh, the global human talent shortage that will exist. So one of the reasons why this is important is because by owning your credentials, by being able to prove that you're qualified, certified, and competent to do those jobs, it is something that's going to, one, allow you to stand out in the ecosystem, but two, it provides a much more comfortable um, business case for an employer to actually want to hire you versus somebody else. You've all seen uh, organizations like LinkedIn starting to move towards uh, the verify your profile or identity on LinkedIn. And next is the verify your employment on LinkedIn um, from your employer. Those are just small milestones that are taken over into uh, growing this ecosystem of trust. So the problem or the opportunity. So I brought this quote over from our uh, director of identity, Michael Birchall. And Michael's been in this space for more than he likes to admit in years. Um, and has been um, a member of Oasis and other organizations that developed some of the OAuth, SAML, and other standards that we currently use in our development practices. And the way that he framed um, the problem today is, technology has created a problem and Creativera has created a solution. Technology made it really easy for us to send documents and exchange information. But once it made it that easy, it made it hard to verify who was sending you this information. So that's a, that's a message that really resonates with a lot of us because the moment you started opening up the world of emails, the world of um, digital communication, there's been a lot of phishing. There's been a lot of fake accounts. There's been a lot of people that are impersonating other people. And this is one of the, the critical components as to why the world um, is no longer just trusting that the information that comes across is actually true or real information. Well, imagine how powerful that statement becomes when you're dealing with the world that I work in, which is ensuring that the folks that show up to a job site are actually qualified, competent, and ready to actually work. So this is, this specific snapshot is actually a summer student 
that is working for an energy company. And this is the credentials that they have to carry at any given point in time that they have to present on paper. And let's not forget that you know, PDF is a 30 year old technology now. So in case people don't think about that very often, it is a 30 year old technology. So what do we do with technology that's typically that old? Well, we typically try to surpass it or you know, supersede it with newer technologies. Well, imagine how easy it is for me to fake or uh, to misprint this information, right? So how would I, sitting at a operations facility where I might have 100, up to 800 people walking through my facility a day, how can I verify that this information that's presented here is truthful, it's in good standing today? The best I can do is potentially catch the delta of this data, but we can't really catch every single person um, of having a fraudulent experience within our organization. So for us at Creative Era, we wanted to create, as I mentioned, that ability for everybody to win. The one group that wins is the employers, ensuring that their workforce is actually qualified. The second group that wins is the individuals who are now able to manage and control their identity in a digital format so they can share, they can revoke, or they can choose to selectively disclose certain data about them. That's just what's required for that uh, job completions or compliance. And then also for the issuing bodies of certifications, because these issuing bodies of certifications cannot control how, pub how somebody states publicly and represents themselves publicly once they receive this credential. So imagine if now there's an opportunity for them to actually control the status of that credential or that designation or that professional membership. So if I say that I'm a CA or a CPA or I'm PNG, how do you know that I actually haven't lapsed on my designation last week? And I'm not a good actor and I won't tell my employer that I haven't paid my dues or done my 30 hours of continuous training or upskilling every three years. So I've now put my employer at risk of a non-compliance for field operations. Furthermore, I've put the rest of my colleagues at risk if a non-compliance or a health and safety issue did happen because I wasn't uh, meeting my regulatory requirements um, as an individual. So it is no longer just about you, but it's also about supporting your fellow members as well. So what was the solution that we ultimately came up with? We created a secure exchange for verifying professional credentials. So this is where I mentioned the ability for the employer, who can also be a certificate, to be able to work with their employees, to be able to provide proof and requests of each other of what information is needed for them to fulfill their jobs, to allow the holder to actually communicate in real time with the issuers. And by the way, the Credivera network, when we say it's one of the largest exchanges, is we because we already have over 10,000 training providers, associations, drug and alcohol testing, background screening, and um, insurance providers that we can verify information from at source in real time. So imagine how powerful it is when the issuer and the holder and the verifier can all work off of a single source of truth with instant verification and communication to each other. And if anything was to happen on the issuer side, where something was to lapse or was to be revoked, then the holder and the verifier would be instantly notified of that change. And the verifier can, or the employer can now make a decision as to whether they want to accept that individual to be on their job site today or potentially put the company at risk. But this information is done now, is now completed knowingly rather than um, having to find out in a later audit, which typically only happens about once a year. So I showed you the, the process, how it is on paper. This is what it looks like when we start opening it up in a digital wallet. Our wallet is a web wallet based tool that allows us to uh, basically be available on any single device um, and on every uh, mobile uh, web browser. So it allows an individual to now be aware of every single job site that they're required to go to and know what are their minimum requirements before they're able to actually work. So with this information at their fingertips, an individual can present their credentials that are being asked for to prove competencies or training. And the employer can now provide the person with a green pass that basically says you're able to go into work. Sounds simple, <laughs> but 
the logical steps that are built behind this. We've been we've been building this framework and the edge cases for the last three years as a technology company. So though we started in 2018, we didn't bring our first kind of blue sky, first iteration of our product to market until April 2020. And basically for the last three years, we've been refining the product, increasing the network, and um, we'll get into a second deeper into the, into the different methods that we're using and, and how we're allowing that to happen. But this kind of brings you into the, into the understanding as to why we ended up doing what we're doing. So let's go into the technology choices and the why component. So definitely big believers in self-sovereign identity. Um, and also um, outside of DIFF, uh, Creative Era participates in CIO Strategy Council. Um, we work with DSVIP in the US. Um, we're partners with Government of Canada um, on some of their initiatives. And um, obviously that's how we ended up working really closely with ID Lab as well. Um, we're also uh, participants in DIAC. So we're very much focused on understanding the different standards that are not just um, locally to Canada, but also globally as they're being adopted. Because our clients are not just in Canada or in the US, but they're actually global clients. So we have folks that operate across Europe, um, that operate across the US, that operate across Canada. So we want to make sure that we follow all the different groups according to what they're building and launching. So one of the things that's important to understand here is the SSI wallet um, in which the user, the holder, can not only store verifiable credentials, but also can store verifiable presentations. So that's an important um, aspect to, to talk about here because this is what we call a stackable credential. And that stackable credential allows us to also have stackable, present, uh, stackable verifiable credentials. We did build with Microsoft Intra ID uh, or Verified ID. So behind the scenes, we've been working with the Verified ID team for probably about the last two years in order to enhance the tool that, that's been launched on their Microsoft Authenticator and making sure that we can um, interop with them specifically on the didion methods, as well as some of the other methods that we're using personally. The reason why we did this is because uh, Microsoft is obviously a massive um, platform that is used by over 22 million companies across the world, from privately owned businesses to public um, organizations. And it gives you a reach that you typically wouldn't have had if you just went to market just by yourself. And their passion and their growth into where they're seeing the verifiable credentials. And now as we're seeing it with LinkedIn, um, you can just imagine the, the sheer network of that. Um, LinkedIn has over 850 million users. Let's assume even half of them uh, receive their first verifiable credential. You're now going to have over 400 million verifiable credentials in the market uh, that are actually truly being put to good use and practice. So what a phenomenal way to, to see that engagement. Um, in the technology side, the user and the employer get instant notifications uh, that the conditions have been met for that job assignment. And then the VC is verified in real time, supporting a zero trust cyber approach uh, for the workforce. So the reason why this is important is because it allows you now to do a few other things as an employer. So now you can manage how and when mission critical applications are accessed. So think about the Creative Era platform of me being able to uh, take that verifiable credential, pass it to my intro verified ID into my Microsoft Authenticator, provision it with a VC of my employee ID, and now allowing that VC to um, ultimately enhance um, Active Directory and role-based access controls or RBAC. So we've taken that process quite far into actually allowing for organizations to be able to manage um, access applications as well. So VCs are also used for logical and physical access. So think about the, that grouping of credentials that I showed you in the picture earlier. Imagine how powerful that is when you know that this is what it takes for somebody to be able to pass through a gate or for somebody to get into a secure room where you need to ensure that their background check, their um, credentials are in good, good standing. And now you can actually go in and perform your job. Let's say you're working on a server room uh, within the organization. 
Now I actually know who's there and that they were qualified and certified to be there. The VCs are also um, deployed using today's IT capabilities. So why this is important to note is we don't expect our clients to make any enhancements to their platforms. We actually bolt onto existing technologies as they have them today. So that makes it really easy for them to want to adopt technologies like this because out of the box, they don't have to go out and do upgrades or hire specific talent in, in house to be able to support this technology. It is now coming out of the box for them. And that was one of the critical components that took us quite some time to, to put together. So when we talk about market adoption and market penetration, uh, we made it very easy for anybody to want to adopt this technology and have a frictionless experience within our, within our platform. User adoption. So why is this important? What, why is it what we're doing important? And if you go to resumebuilder.com, we found this really neat uh, slide that I think it's it, it will bring smile to a lot of us because we can we've all seen and gone through this and we've questioned people and you can only question so much before you sound like you're being rude about it. But the reality is when 85% of job applicants have misrepresented themselves on their application, that's a huge number. But when 20 to 30% of applicants have invented a degree, now imagine the power of a verifiable credentials network where you can ensure that the information that's being presented to you as the employer is actually verified at source. It, it's knowing of who actually issued it and you can ensure that the information was not altered with before it was presented to you. That is a very, very powerful trifecta for why this is so important today. So when we look at from that market adoption and, and we look at Creative Era, and the example that we're providing here is specifically in the oil and gas frontline worker credentials. However, Creative Era works across a myriad of, of use cases. We work with recruitment agencies. We work with energy companies. We work with construction companies. We work with within the healthcare industry. So we have a myriad of applications of where an individual that's highly qualified and trained has to be able to prove their competencies and training in good standing at all times. So this is the component of why we're able to ensure worker compliance, but we're also able to protect sensitive information. So the protection of sensitive information is important because this is where by providing a secure and tamper evident solution for managing this frontline worker information, the individual is actually in control of their data. So very much this also becomes a portable digital identity wallet that once the individual stops their employment or their contract with the organization that provisioned them with this wallet, which is our client, um, as we sell directly to businesses, to enterprises, the individual can now actually take their wallet, decouple it from the employer and bring it with them through their life journey. So it becomes a very powerful tool when you can now allow the individual to not just own their identity, but be able to present their identity forward to the next employment opportunity. So by creating this kind of a process, it also enhances the compliance and auditing that a company goes through, where now they can allow an auditor to come in under an auditor uh, profile in the platform and go to a specific job site or a location or a building and be able to see that the folks that were provisioned for that environment to work in for the duration of that project or for duration of that specific task, they met all the competencies and trainings that were required. Bonnie. Um, Dan, I'm curious um, about sort of the user adoption journey when it comes to the, the three ends of the triangle. Yeah. Um, so of course there's a user which we can all relate with because we've got credentials that we carry with us. Um, you talked about having the various organizations of issuers coming on board. And then of course, then the actual companies, the employers who need to verify their employee credentials. Maybe touch on what the journey <clears throat> has been like for each of those. And and I, I kind of imagine this network effect where, you know, if if an employee okay. uses it at one job site, they might think, oh my, my goodness, how come this other company isn't doing it? And then they might ask them like, what, what, is, what does that look like at the beginning to kind of get it started and, 
and kind of go get through the friction versus now when there's a, you know, the exchange has a little bit more participants in it now? Absolutely. It's a good question. So um, in order to start off a project of this nature that has this kind of flywheel effect uh, method um, or multi-sided marketplace method associated to it, you have to find a trusted um, participant. So the, the company you're going to work with, which is typically your first buyer, has to be a very open-minded organization that's looking to change because either they feel this pain point or they realize this is something that's coming to them. And for us, what was really interesting, uh, Bonnie, was the finding that balance between uh, that comment that I just made, but also making people aware of the um, identity challenges that are coming into Canada and the US, where people's data and privacy is now something to be recognized within an organization, or within a corporation. So we started with our first client was actually um, a small construction company. There were about 500 employees. Um, but what we realized was that 500 employees are just their full-time employees, but they were running roughly 300 continuous projects, which means that they had a very large supplier network um, of suppliers that were supplying them with the workforce to complete those projects. So we wanted to make sure that we also plucked a few of those suppliers uh, that really trust our partner in this process and ask them to be a part of this, this use case. So all of a sudden what happened is they saw a new level of trust that was built between um, the evidence of proof before you come to site that your, that your workforce that you're provisioning me with as a construction company, that the workforce of the supplier is actually qualified before they come to work. So that started its first part of the network effect. And what was really neat is that once people started uploading their credentials and certifications, um, we had them in a self-verified status. And then we, we allowed our operations team to now start going and taking a look at what are those issuer names of the training providers that are actually being proposed as, please prove that this information is true. So then we started opening up the doors with those uh, training providers and talking to them about the use case and the value of what it's like to have this real-time visibility and this new confidence and level of trust. So now the issuers, um, in this case, the, the training providers, also start, started seeing benefits of the technology for themselves because they could now start getting notifications of, hey, Bonnie's coming up for her, you know, WIMIS certification, recertification. And Bonnie might have changed three construction companies in that three years timeline between when she first received it, that training, to the moment that she had to reuse it again or re upskill. So now imagine how powerful it is for me as an issuer to now know that I can, I guess, upsell to you three years later that course that you need to take anyway. So for them, it became a, um, a financial incentive and benefit to actually want to be a part of this process. Now, when we started talking about associations or professional designation bodies, the value that they saw was the public safety aspect and the respect of their credential. Because if I'm, let's say, a PEGA and I, ver and I certify you as an engineer, but you no longer perform your duties under a PEGA regulations to maintain that engineering license, should you still be able to say publicly that you're an engineer? Or two, should you be able to stamp a document with your engineering designation? And the reality is no. And they don't have a way to control that publicly today. So for us, by enabling this ecosystem uh, component, it actually gave them the opportunity to say, now I can control when Dan uh, states that they can sign a document or not on behalf of a company, because the only way that they would not be able to sign it is if they lapsed their uh, membership in standing. So it became a big value for both of these parties right away. And then for the individuals, it's an easy adoption. We made it, our focus was to not create an, um, an enterprise platform that had you know, hours and hours of training required for a, a frontline worker. Our frontline worker training is less than five minutes per person. So imagine putting, you know, I can put 100 people in a room and it still takes five minutes. Um, it's a matter of economies of scale. And it had to be something that's that simple for them to use to then be able to just want to adopt it because it's a bit of a set and forget uh, kind of technology. 
right? So the only time I need to kind of redo something with it, unless I'm using it as part of my uh, on-site access tool every day, um, then my credentials are only required for me to share or revoke when, I, um, when I'm joining a site. Uh, but other than that, for the duration of that project, which by the way, I can time box in the technology, I can time box how long you should have access to something about me. So that's where the, the value really kind of came uh, to them uh, pretty quickly. So we went through this journey experience and we're, we're gonna wrap up here this year with at least 100,000 users on our platform. Um, we're pretty close to that already actually of uh, daily users on our technology um, and uh, some pretty reputable names from the employer side that are global organizations that are using the technology for their daily um, activities. Thanks, Dan. You're welcome. So when we talk about the interoperability approach, one thing that I, I wanted to point out was in the, in the process and the work that we've been doing um, with the government of Canada around digital identity, um, we wanted to make sure that we do something uh, really powerful here, which is that we were going to be interoperable with working products that are using verifiable credentials that are going to meet different provincial requirements across Canada. As we know, in Canada, different provinces are looking at different standards uh, for adoption. And, then, and there might be a national standard, but there will be also provincially based standards that are going to be used. So we wanted to make sure that we, we created a technology that allows for interoperability and verifiable credential exchange or exchanges where if somebody signs something in a different did method than somebody else, you shouldn't be allowed to not have that interop between these systems or these platforms. So even though as a, as a baseline standard, we use the W3C um, you know, div standard uh, for did web, we do recognize that there's many standards that are gonna be built. And organizations of certain sizes that are going to be large enough will also command their own DIT standards. So you want to be able to make sure that you create a solution that's robust enough that allows for that verifiable credential interoperability and exchange in such a way in which people can also have the true portability of their uh, of their identity, whether it's foundational or whether it's work identity, that they can take it with them to the different wallets. Because the one thing I'm pretty sure we can all agree on is there won't be a single wallet to win them all. There will be many wallets for many purposes and many reasons. And the way that I typically look at identity in this space is there's three forms of identity, in my opinion. There's the foundational identity that we're seeing a lot of the folks obviously head down the path of. Then there's the workforce identity. And then there's your personal at home identity. Right, so think about you being a soccer coach for your kids, you know, your boys team. Well, you need certain credentials to be able to do that. You'll need to do background checks, you'll need to do criminal checks, you'll need to be able to do, you know, be able to prove that you are who you say you are, right? So foundational identity check. You'll be able to maybe have to go to certain coaching schools or take courses for, you know, how to talk to kids without scaring them. Um, so these are things that become part of your at-home um, persona. And, and it's a mix of everything from your foundational as well as your career identity. So for us, we recognize that there will be wallets that will ultimately um, work with each one of these um, use cases, but you also need interoperability availability. So for us, that was key when we started developing our technology to allow everybody to ultimately work together. So uh, not too long ago, Creative Route did a public presentation with uh, Interac, two keys, um, and their did key methods, and interoperated with Mavenet, which is a supply chain um, uh, platform that uses verifiable credentials um, for the verity of the supply chain. And what was really interesting here is between Creative Vera, Interac, and Mavenet, and ultimately the Microsoft Authenticator and their did ION method, everybody was using a different did signature. So we had to find a way in which we can create a true interoperability that allowed us as the presenter to hold them create a verifiable presentation where we don't lose the uh, cryptographic security of these did exchanges and then allowed everybody to ultimately still be able to control their own components. 
So for example, on the interact side with the div key method, the presentation was a presentation of, a, of an identity of an individual. Well, even through the exchange and the sharing of this, the individual that used that did key method should still have the ability to revoke back or to acknowledge the use of their identity as it's being passed down the, uh, the food chain. So with this kind of a process and the development that we've done behind the scenes, even though the, the verifiable presentation was created with different verifiable credentials, the owner of that initial verifiable credential should still be able to do the revocation. And that's what we were able to ultimately present in our public presentation with the government of Canada um, earlier this year, which um, we worked closely also with ID Lab to do all of our testing and to ensure that our methods are actually meeting uh, the standards that we're looking to present. So what's next? You know, I can talk about my business all day and talk about the growth and what we're experiencing, what we're seeing, where it's going. But I thought this was something really, really powerful that we can all take away with us in the, in the ecosystem ahead. And I know I'm going to read it out loud, but it's a lot more powerful when you read it out loud. So identity today is where financial services were 15 years ago and therefore represents one of the largest opportunities of this generation. Regardless that it's Forbes, we know that it's ID tech, but ID tech being the new FinTech is a very powerful statement when you're trying to get people to start paying attention and to understand that this is where the change is coming. This is the new requirement for you to be able to, uh, to meet your, not just your internal employer environment, but also how you're gonna support your um, business community or your stewards of their identities. And this is why we know that this technology is about to go into pretty much a brand new hem hemisphere of its own. So um, I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm excited to have had a chance to talk with you guys here today at DIFF. And we obviously look forward to continuing to participate in DIFF and being a part of this. Claire, I'm gonna come off the screen now so we can just chat. That was tremendous. Um, I always, I'm so thrilled when I see production use cases. When I first started this job, that was the first question I got from my friends. Well, once they understood what the decentralized identity or self sovereign identity was, they want to know, are there any production use cases? And so that leads me to my question. And that's a great, powerful message from Forbes. Um, can you describe the business model, the business model for sure. Credivera, for <clears throat> the issues, the verifiers? Yeah, it's a very simple business model. And Bonnie laughs at me every time uh, because we only charge the employers. We don't, so we charge them for the number of uh, employees that they have. And this is basically the wallet issuance or provisioning, but we don't charge anybody else in the network. Once the individual leaves, if they leave with a wallet and they go to the next employer, they get to keep that wallet at no cost. The issuers, there's no transaction costs. There's no, none of that stuff. Um, so it's a very simple, single pointed B2B SaaS model and that's it. Yeah, I love it. Cause I, in, um, I used to work for another company, I won't name names, but we were building a privacy preserving authentication service based on zero knowledge proofs and a, a um, bespoke digital ledger and our own tokens. and. For me to explain the business model would, would take two hours almost because it was very complex and we had loyalty points and we want to make sure everyone got a slice. Of it. But I'm very glad to hear that you've got a oh. simple business model. I think that'll be very successful. Yeah, if I can present it on a quarter screen and three lines in a page, then I've done I've done all right. Bravo. Um, yeah. Because there's there's zero friction and and there's no uh, misunderstanding of what the services they're purchasing and the value that they're getting out of those services. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, my pleasure. Uh, by the way, everybody, there's no bad questions. So just feel free to open up and ask me anything you want. I have pretty much zero filters. So I'll just kind of tell you. <laughs> Anyone else? Quiet, quiet bunch today. All right. So, um, yeah, I guess I was just curious about, um, you said you used did, you used did web 
-hmm. at Cordovera. Yeah. Can you say so, more about your choice in uh, using DidWeb? So I'll maybe rattle off a few things just to kind of give you a, an insider on our side. So from a file format perspective, we use JSON Web Tokens and JSON LD. From a signatures perspective, we're ED25519. Um, from a universal resolver perspective, we test with Diff, um, Herzner, and Azure. So we kind of have a, a nice broad spectrum of where we can present and, and such. Um, and as I mentioned in, in the presentation, we also support verifiable credentials, verifiable presentations, and uh, we're now st supporting stackable verifiable credentials, stackable VCs. So when it comes down to the, um, to the diff standards and methods, you know, we, we have web, ion, um, we're going to launch the ETH as well, because we do have some folks that might want to go down that path. So we might as well just support it out of the box. Um, and we obviously support some of our partners, uh, did methods like did key for Intrac, um, Mavenet's personal uh, diff method or did method. Um, so we're we've kind of created um, think of it a bit of as a translation um, engine that just allows us to work with pretty much any of the of the schemas that come to us that say, hey, can you also interrupt and do this with this? But did web why? Simply the you know the W3C standard that just makes logical sense for where people are going to head first before they start getting deeper into potentially other DID methodologies, and um, before large organizations are going to get more familiarized with the other methods and start creating their own identity practices internally that are then going to go further down the rabbit holes of where else they should be playing. Uh, what's important is to ensure that the schemas that we use are um, managing the information appropriately. Um, so behind the scenes, we carry a lot of schema types, which is really good because it, it allows us to um, do things like, you know, like the people schema, the education schemas, the... Um, I don't even know. There's so many of them. It's just it's a plethora of. Um, so we're always going to make sure that the way that the information is packaged is ultimately meeting the the standard of how it's going to be presented and and uh, verified. Claire. Um, yeah, lower my hand. Yes, thank you. So I'm a big fan of, of Did Web. When people ask me what's your favorite Did, I said, well, if you want to get started, start with Did Key. And uh, Daniel sure. Buckner has coined this term. Um, he calls did key the gateway, did web, did method, excuse me. And then you can graduate to did web. And the nice thing about did web is that it doesn't depend on an underlying digital ledger or blockchain. So it's a lot easier for people to um, get their arms around. And no, if you listen to podcasts, I love podcasts. Um, there's a podcast called The Rubric. And they interview people and simply ask them, what's your favorite uh, uh, did method? And then they'll interview people. Some of the podcasts are two parts. Did Web podcast is a two part because they have Ori Steele and Turbo, I forget, Turbo Oliver, I guess, Oliver Turbo. They have um, two guests discussing Did Web for two podcast series, part one and part two. So if anyone's interested in learning more about did web, uh, look at the podcast called the rubric. That sounds awesome. Yeah. yeah and I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I mentioned one of the things earlier is about frictionless deployment and allowing organizations to just use their existing technologies to be able to embrace this and to have as an adoption. And that's a frictionless deployment. Like we've we've taken some of our um, clients, their their CISOs, their VPs of IT, or their uh, heads of identity, and we've literally brought them up to speed in an hour. It's like here's what this means to you. Here's how it's gonna work. And why don't we just get you to play around a little bit in the sandbox? And if you have just enough technical chops, you can do that on your own. And they get comfortable with it pretty quickly. And they're like, oh, okay, that's really what it is. And it's like, yeah, that's what it is, but it's game changing. Um, so here's why you now want it being deployed. So it makes it, you know, you always have to find in the business to business space, and especially in our world where 
Um, you know, we deal with a lot of legacy systems. We deal with a lot of, you know, certain cases at best um, a homegrown database or Excel spreadsheets. You kind of want to be able to, to make something so easy and meaningless in a way for them to deploy that they don't even think twice about it. So that's been our approach to market. It's worked well in my past two tech companies that I've built, scaled, and exited. And um, that's uh, that's why we, we did it this way. But always chase the newer technology and always chase the newer, cool, cooler, shinier things and push them forward. So if you have the audience, they'll trust you and they'll just keep doing it with you. All right. Last call for questions. We've got a few minutes left. If not, we'll give um, eight or nine minutes back to everybody. Awesome. Um, yeah, one last question. Um, Dan, would you be okay if we posted this uh, presentation to YouTube, to our Diff YouTube channel? Sure, go for it. Okay. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. There's nothing here that I presented that I think would be inappropriate. Okay, great. Yeah, and thank you so much for for everything. It, it's it's very interesting just to hear this whole adoption journey uh, that your company has gone through. I think it gave me a lot of insight. So thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it, and I look forward to for us to continue to contribute to Diff and to be a member. Um, it's a phenomenal organization. So you guys are changing the world. So keep doing what you're doing. It's awesome. Awesome. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks again. Thanks, thanks Dan. Have a good day, everyone. Have a Great presentation. Day. Bye, Bye, everybody.